This video is part of a series. It's heavy in scientific terminology and may expect familiarity with previous videos. If you're confused, please watch the rest of the playlist up until this point, or check out my genetics terminology document, both of which are linked in the description. Thanks! <laughs> I'm in danger! So, full disclosure, I did a ton of research and it was a wild ride, an endless rabbit hole full of dead ends, and four entire pages of wall-to-wall -wall notes with no helpful answers. I made a poll asking my audience if I should condense all of this info into just the important bits and stick it in the body morph vid, or if I should bite the bullet and read out everything even though it's useless. And folks pretty overwhelmingly wanted to hear me scream and die, so here we go. There are an absolute fuck-ton amount of ear types in dogs, and they all have the same insane amount of phenotypic variety as dogs themselves. The teal deer is simply what makes the most sense with a sheer amount of variation. Ears are polygenetic. But there's two loci that have more sway than others, and we don't know their dominance. The main difference between ears that probably immediately comes to your head is floppy versus pointy, but real scientific categorization of ear types is actually more complicated. These erect ears that stand upright aren't always pointy, sometimes they have rounded tips. Thus, there's two critical distinctions between ear types which align with those two loci I mentioned. Floppy versus prick, which is the erect ears, and round wide versus pointy. Floppy ears are called drop, but I'm just gonna stick with calling them floppy for funsies. One of my sources calls them pendulous, which is great. And yes, round and wide go hand in hand. Roundness and wideness are apparently pleiotropic, at least in the primary causative gene that was studied. So what about cocked ears, which are halfway between prick and drop? <laughs> Put another way, and simplified, the combination of these two genes puts the dog generally into one of four categories, and then a bunch of other things control exact appearance from there. And I say a bunch of other stuff because it's actually not just polygenes. The nature of these mutations, one of which is a link RNA mutation, means that there's a ton of regulatory factors involved in expression. And there's physics, which we'll talk about later. Which is bad news for writers and artists, because if it was just a gradient trait, we could say whatever and make the kids look similar to the parents, but no. Now we have to figure out how these two genes work. Cue my deep dive. The floppy ear gene seems to have been narrowed down after much fuss to MSRB3, a region on canine chromosome 10 also associated with deafness in humans. This is the one where the mutation affects a link RNA, which doesn't mean much to you, but I find it fascinating. What's a link RNA? Good question! Scientists don't know either. They're traditionally defined as strands of RNA that don't code for proteins, but it turns out a lot of them do code for proteins, so that's causing some problems. We can't even seem to decide how long long qualifies as. But link RNA stands for long intergenic non-coding RNA, and that's our answer right there. It's long as opposed to short. It's inter, which means within, and genic, which is genes. So it's between genes. But it's non-coding. It's also RNA, not DNA. RNA are a bunch of helpful little guys also made up of nucleotides, and one of the most important, if thought, the most important thing they do is transcribe, that is, write down, and then translate, that is, turn into proteins, our DNA. DNA isn't just floating around loose, it's wrapped up tight in histones. This super-wrapped package of DNA, histones, and some other packaging stuff is called chromatin. mRNA, the RNA responsible for transcribing DNA, can't do its job if it can't access the DNA behind this giant protective barrier it's thoroughly wrapped in. A lot of things control whether mRNA is allowed to get past the chromatin to access the DNA, how much, and where. Very little of your genome actually directly codes for proteins, and that's even if we ignore quote-unquote junk DNA. Most genes control or create regulatory processes or stuff related to transcription and translation. Because what's the point of having a bunch of protein codes if no one's around to access it, or has no way to? Link RNA is involved in this process. The mutation in MSRB3 that causes floppy ears doesn't code for a direct change to the ear's protein makeup that makes it flop. Instead, it codes for something that regulates expression of ear-related genes, causing them to be read differently, which makes the ear flop. Whew, that's a lot, and it's super oversimplified, and I barely understand link RNA myself, so I hope that that wasn't too bad. But we're not done with MSRB3 yet. I found an article that looked into the many, many genes responsible for overall dog size, and suggested that one of them, HMGA2, may be linked to the part of MSRB3 that determines ear, flop, or prickness. Linkage is not pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when one gene does multiple things. Linkage is when multiple genes are doing different things as normal, but their loci are sitting very close to each other on the chromosome. 
So when a cell is preparing to do meiosis and becomes gametes, eggs or sperm, they do this thing called recombination, where they swap chunks of DNA with each other. Those chunks are more or less random, but the closer two genes are, the more likely they'll get traded together. I mean, think about it logically. You've got a strand of ten people holding hands. At random, two people let go. You're in this strand holding two hands, your left and right respectively, so you have an 8 out of 10 chance you'll still be holding those hands, and only a 2 out of 10 chance of letting go of either hand. Ear controlling genes MSRB3 is holding hands with two other genes, well actually way more, but two that are relevant here, and there's a higher percent chance of staying held than letting go. This doesn't mean that a dog with floppy ears is necessarily bigger or smaller than dogs with prick ears. What it does mean is that doing two separate Punnett squares for ear floppiness gene and body size gene won't get you accurate percentages for the puppies, but I don't really think that this is that much of a problem since this is just one body mass locus of which there are countless. I guess just keep in mind that if you pair, say, a really big dog with prick ears to a really small dog with floppy ears, at least one of the genes responsible for body size is going to hitch a ride, and you're slightly more likely to get bigger puppies with bigger parents' ears and smaller puppies with smaller parents' ears. At least when it comes to floppy versus pricked. But it's not an absolute thing. One article claims to have found a correlation between the ear flopping MSRB3 with a gene that contributes to boldness, which... Whoo! That's a minefield to navigate for a lay person educator like me. Genes contribute to every part of you, but are not the end-all be-all of your personality. I do not want anyone getting the wrong idea from articles like this that A. People just have a boldness gene somewhere that makes them brave or meek. Or B. That dogs with one ear type are always bold or something like that. Both of those ideas are bullshit. First of all, boldness was determined in the study not by evaluating individual dogs, but by an overall breed average. Breeds were ranked as either bold or non-bold overall, and dogs in the study were categorized based on their breed, nothing else. Second of all, this is only one tiny gene controlling something as massive and complex as personality, being studied herein by analyzing breeds who have been separately selectively bred for specific temperaments for thousands of years. Third of all, this is linkage, not pleiotropy. I don't want any of you to accidentally start promoting genetic fatalism because you misunderstood and oversimplified an article about Jack Russell's having floppy ears, okay? Genetic fatalism is a eugenics mentality. Genes are more complicated than that. I wouldn't personally include or utilize this in fiction at all. It's a complex thing that really only applies in the context of these larger breed haplotypes. It's very easy to give the wrong idea to an audience, and I'm actually not the biggest fan of this article in the first place. But it has useful info, it's linked in the description as a source, and I didn't want anyone less informed reading it without mentioning it here. Okay, that's the floppy versus prick locus out of the way. On to the pointy versus big round locus. It's pleiotropic, causing the ear both to be wider in the middle and round at the tip. The only article I could find that covers this narrowed it down to two potential candidates, and the more likely candidate is KCNQ5 on canine chromosome 12. This is another gene associated with deafness in other species, and if I'm reading this right, this article I found associating it with ear shapes in dogs claims to be the first to recognize its role in something other than hearing ability. Neat. This one's, thankfully, much more straightforward. Well, moving on. Yeah, no, jokes aside, I could not find information on this one. The article that mentioned it discovered it, and it doesn't seem to have been followed up on since, but it's cool that we know, or at least think that we know, the region associated, at least. They don't even know what the mutation is yet that I could find, just an idea of where it's probably located. I'm at a pretty big loss for any kind of dominance models here, but I think I know why. It's the reason dogs are hard to study in general. Dog domestication is ancient. Dog breeds are ancient, with strong differentiation between them. I'm not a dog breed expert, but all the breeds that I know of have a set, standard ear shape. There are mutts and strays, but with the exception of dumbass labradoodle shit, no one's breeding mutts and keeping track of their lineages. Stray dogs breed with each other freely all the time, but there's no one writing down their pedigrees. If you want to know if a gene is dominant, recessive, or something else, examining all available pedigrees just shows you the same ear phenotype over and over again, no matter which one you're looking at. That being said, in all of my digging and with the help of a kindly fan, I have two sources making different claims about ear floppiness dominance. The only source of any dominance anything regarding ear type that I could find on my own was... 
a fucking front page advertisement for a genetic testing panel. You know, the section of the website that's like, what are genes? Why should you get your dog tested? That offhandedly mentions floppy ears as an example of a dominant gene. Unfortunately, unlike UC Davis or similar gene testing panels, this website doesn't have individual pages on specific genes. You just have to buy a full panel, so I can't get more info here. However, I have made a community post asking if any of my fans had good sources for inheritance models and someone very cool sent me, thank God, an actual source. It's a different genetic panel, and it has some interesting wording. It doesn't directly use the word incomplete dominance, but describes having, quote, a single copy of the variant causing an intermediate phenotype, aka heterozygotes are somewhere between the two homozygotes, which is just describing incomplete dominance. So it seems like this website is claiming that pricked ears are caused by one allele, floppy ears are caused by another allele, and when you combine them into a heterozygote, you get an in-between phenotype. Cocked ears? But there must be something more going on than that because cocked ears are standard in some breeds, like the Jack Russell. And that couldn't happen if cocked ears were purely because of heterozygosity. You can't fix a heterozygous phenotype. Breeding two together has a 50-50 chance of homozygous offspring. Maybe it means something else by intermediate phenotype, but it makes me not totally trust this source. But wait, did you catch that? I said Jack Russell. Didn't I mention Jack Russell's earlier, too? I did, and I was talking about a study that analyzed the floppy ear gene. I haven't read this anywhere, this is my own guess based on looking at the dogs and photos given as examples. I think at least some cock-eared dogs are actually floppy pointy dogs. Think about it. Unlike the big round gene, the pointy gene doesn't contribute size. So when it flops, it just doesn't have enough ear to be fully floppy. And it's also possible that polygenes responsible for ear size that have nothing to do with the big round locus can cause the same thing to happen in genetically pointy ears. So even pricked pointy ears, if big enough, are affected by gravity and become cocked. This would help explain dogs who have just one cocked ear, too. Thus, cocked ears probably aren't a single phenotype caused by a specific gene or genotype, but rather a range of possible ear types that resemble each other from different causes. That's my educated guess based on all the info I've gathered anyway, and it's the best we've got for now. <laughs> Unfortunately, that would invalidate one of our gene testing websites claim that floppy ears is incompletely dominant. In any other situation, in a heartbeat, I would trust an actual gene test website over my own harebrained guesstimates. But, as I said, a lot of breeds are fixed for cocked ears. At the same time, I'm not gonna just outright say these people who have more qualifications than me are wrong without some kind of more serious evidence, so my best guess is that when they say intermediate, they aren't referring to cock ears. Simple as that. But if that's the case, I have no idea what they are referring to. That means the closest thing we have to a dominance model is an offhand line from a glorified advertisement stating that floppy ears are dominant over pricked ears. I don't know if this is better than nothing, but it's probably something. So what about the other primary locus, pointy versus long round? Yeah, me neither. As for letters, neither website has any. Whew. So, after all that fun, what does this actually boil down to for writers and artists making fictional family trees? For the floppy prick locus, let's call floppy dominant. For the pointy round locus, pick one. Do their punnets separately, like normal. Any combination of results is what the range of puppies can be. For example, here's one parent with floppy round ears and a parent with floppy pointy ears. I'm using F as my letter for floppy prick ears, capital F is floppy, and little f is pricked. Both parents are carriers. For my purposes, I'm saying that pointy is dominant over big round. I'll represent pointy with P and big round with PR. The pointy parent is homozygous for P, pause to solve. For the floppy locus, the puppy's ears can either be floppy or pricked. For the pointy locus, there's no scenario in which this puppy can have big round ears. They'll always be pointy. That means puppies from this pairing can either be floppy and pointy or pricked and pointy. It's a few extra steps, but it's not any different from, say, determining if a cat is smoke or silver just with shape instead of color. Two loci interact to make four potential phenotypes instead of two. For whether a puppy can be cock-eared or not, you've got leniency. If we go off my theory that cocked has multiple causes and some of them aren't genetic, go off the parents. If a parent has cocked ears, the puppy is more likely to have cocked ears if they have the same phenotype. How likely? Just use logic. For example, Tramp from Lady and the Tramp has cocked ears. The real life dog he's based on is a Schnauzer mix. That looks pretty pointy to me, but it's also a pretty big ear compared to other pointy ears like German Shepherds. So I think there might be other genes here outside of our main two contributing to size, making the ear flop over. That's my guess. 
And of course, Lady's got real long Cocker Spaniel ears, so she ain't contributing much in the way of small, even in the rest of her polygenes outside of just the big round locus. That means it makes sense that Scamp here also has cocked ears. He has his dad's pointy gene and all of his size polygenes too that make his ears big, despite being pointy and the physics makes them droop, just like dad. Angel also has ears that are both prick and pointy, but they're a little bit smaller and usually only one flops. The other only flops when she leans forward. That means that despite being different at the main loci, Scamp has additional size polygenes from Tramp that Angel doesn't have, making his ears consistently cocked whereas Angel's aren't. <sighs> that was the closest thing to practice squares you're getting from me this video. Ooh, I need to lay down. I love you. I'll see you when I finally get to the rest of morphology. Until then, bye bye.